Now the Shaftsma think that what they have here is an early example of the Kachina cult. Uh, they, um, that it then spread up, uh, up the Rio Grande fairly early in time, fairly uh, shortly after 1300, and then spread westward. So east, west, west, east, who knows. Where did it come from? The Shaftsmas and the Adams also wonder if it might not be from Membrace. Uh, Casas Grandis, well, the real question as to whether the Casas Grandis even had a Kachina cult. Some people say yes, some people say no. But um, at any rate, it's quite early, and uh, it may date at least in part from this earlier intrusion, though it certainly was propelled and uh, greatly expanded by the Casas Grandis phenomenon. Now, go back to our Aslan map. Aslan map. Um, from wherever it came, the Kachina complex was probably universal in the Pueblo area before the end of the century, that is, before the end of the 14th century. It merged with such northern features as the Kiva, and the enclosed courtyard or enclosed plaza, which are important throughout the Kachina world because uh, uh, the plazas were used for these linear dances, which are typical of Kachinas, uh, these masked figures. Um, uh, the um, plazas may have actually appeared a little earlier. Uh, some people date them as early as the uh, late 12th century up in the Rio Grande, or even, in, or, I mean, the late 13th century, late 1200s, or early. Uh, actually, when you get around to it, the uh, great Chaco site of Casas Grandes is a perfectly good enclosed plaza. I don't know if anybody has ever pointed out uh, or suggested anything about that. Now, appearing about the same time as a Kachina cult, and clearly linked with the Kachina cult in historic times, certainly, and also apparently in prehistoric times, were societies. The War Society and the Hunt Society. The War Societies, to some degree the Hunt Societies, were essentially uh, associated with Quetzalcoatl in his twin form. The twin war gods of the modern pueblos and their, uh, are their earthly avatars, the, the, the bow priest, twin bow priest, uh, are examples of this. And also, as Kurt Schaffsman, I suggested in, a, in our book, The Casas Grandes World, uh, something that we call a cacique complex. <laughs> I'm being sponsored by Dell. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll go ahead. Uh, the uh, uh, cacique complex is a is an idea in which leaders. De derive their power and their position from the ownership of sacred objects of one sort or the other. It could be a song, could be a, a um, thing, a, a, an element, a, a mask or something. It could be something else. This is um, incredibly widespread in Mesoamerica. Now, um, Steve Lexon has pointed out in a very recent book that he thinks, although he, he uh, agrees that the um, Kasiki complex, as we call it, uh, was uh, clearly Mesoamerican, he thinks it also appeared at Chaco Canyon. Uh, he doesn't give any evidence for this, but I, I think uh, uh, one must consider that as a possibility. But it certainly appeared uh, by the 14th and 15th century. The strong trade affinities 
that the peso saw between Casas Grandes and the rest of the Southwest need uh, some modification. There's a scatter of, Rio, of Casas Grandes pottery in the Rio Grande. Actually, it goes as far as Mesa Verde, believe it or not. Um, there's um, some in the Gila and Salt drainage, quite a lot in the Sonoran Statelets. That's the one place you find a lot of it. Uh, and you find it also to the south as far as Mexico City, but that's another story. But most of the influences flowed into Casas Grandes, not out of Casas Grandes. There were vast amounts of the uh, Salado polychrome, especially Gila polychrome, mainly at Casas Grandes itself. There are thousands of shards. Um, and let's see, are we back on track or is Dell still taking over here? <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, how about, yeah, okay, there's an a example of a uh, Gila polychrome. I don't think that is from Casas Grandes, though. The, um, and also from uh, the Hornada Mogollon, there is um, a, a considerable uh, influx into Casas Grandes. Now, this is El Paso polychrome, as it says. It's kind of lousy polychrome, but I'm not sure it is a polychrome, really. But uh, that's what they call it. There was an importation of raw materials, turquoise, serpentine, and probably other semi-jewel stones from the north and northwest including incredible amounts of seashell from the west coast and metal from further, further south in Mesoamerica. In other words, a lot was coming into Casas Grandes. Uh, we don't know what uh, was going out. Some macaws were, because we find them in southwestern sites, but that's about it, and a little bit of pottery. Casas Grandes may, may have been a ceremonial center of some sort. Uh, in which everything looked inward. I don't know. Well, back to Aslan. Aslan. In any case, the 14th century was a heyday of Aslan. Both the western Pueblo and the eastern Anasazis were going strong. In the middle Rio Grande Basin were the Pueblo towns of the Hornada down here, all up and down the river. The um, further west, the great um, Mogollon sites, which are um, really looking more and more like Pueblo all the time, uh, were flourishing. They're um, the Salado in the Gila Salt area down here. Uh, the um, Hohokam with making, trying to make a come back in the Tucson Basin about here. And in the south, the Sonoran statelets were growing, growing, growing. In the latter 14th century, all this began to unravel. In the west, the Sonawa towns like uh, Chavez, for example, on Anderson Mesa began to, uh, were, were deserted. Um, the Hamalavi sites were deserted. Uh, people fairly moving onto the Hopi Mesas. Uh, they were gone by, say, 1400. To the south, the late Mogollon hybrid sites and the Salado were gone. The Hornado towns in the Rio Grande suffered a total collapse. When the Spaniards in the mid-16th century came, they found the very barbarized, scattered um, people they called the Manso uh, that uh, probably were the descendants, but uh, didn't look anything like them, at least culturally. <laughs> 